Welcome to The Long Game, a podcast where effort, energy, and time matter. Today's guest, again, a friend and a colleague, someone I've met several years ago when we both worked uh, at two different Jesuit colleges and universities. At that time, she was the CIO, Chief Information Officer of Marquette University, Kathy Lang. Today, she's the Vice President of Member Relationships at the Tambellini Group, and it's a position that she's just started, I think, within the last week. Kathy, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. And yes, I just started as VP of Member Relationships at the Tambellini Group. I have not even been here a week yet, so brand new. Uh, but prior to that, I've got like 30 years of experience in higher ed. Um, I spent 16 years as a CIO at Marquette University and many years um, at two other, uh, as a director at two other universities and also the CIO at the University of Wisconsin-La Crosse. In between, I've also done a number of consulting engagements, primarily with higher ed, but also with other industries and um, you know, all different sizes of companies from startups to Fortune 500s and um, also was a CIO at a for-profit called Cielo Talent. 30 years. You must have started years. when you were seven. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> um, unbelievable breadth of experiences, different industries, mm -hmm. different segments, different types of roles. As you're taking on a new role and a new chapter in your career and in your life, what seems to be the area, what are the areas that occupy you the most at the moment? What are your kind of major priorities at this time? Where is your focus? Sure, well, just starting out, my main focus is learning everything, right? About the company, about our services and about we're doing what we're doing. But as I look back throughout my career and what I've pretty much always been interested in is really the leadership aspect, right? I've always looked at my roles, not just what am I doing in my day-to-day -day tasks, but what kind of leadership can I provide? And, um, you know, and how do I do that the best that I possibly can? So as you're learning, um, I have a friend and a colleague uh, at my current university who likes to say I'm listening, learning, and leading at the same time, right? It starts with listening and observing the culture, the environment, and so on. Mm -hmm. um, what do you see as, as some of the major opportunities, whether it's, again, it's early, Mm -hmm. uh, but knowing you, I'm positive that you've done your due diligence and research uh, <laughs> yeah. before you committed to anything new. What do you see as some potential opportunities of growth and either within the organization or the industry that it serves? Mm -hmm. Well, the Tamalini Group is a trusted market advisors to the higher education industry, and we only do higher ed. And that was one of the things that really attracted me to it to begin with, because it is higher ed. And even though, you know, yes, I was a CIO in higher ed, I really tried to understand what's happening in the industry as a whole, right? What does it mean for different universities? And I have colleagues across the country from different types of organizations in higher ed. And so I, I really, that's what excited me about Tamalini's because they, they, they have that breadth of experience and have worked with all those different groups. And I really see the industry as a whole, you know, changing and growing and, you know, especially through the pandemic, look at the changes that many of the, you know, higher ed institutions had to take on going to that asynchronous learning mode and, and, you know, how does that affect the future? Right? I see there's so many opportunities and universities, colleges, community colleges, everyone is going to, they're going to be asking questions, right? How do we take what we've learned? How do we take, you know, maybe legacy systems and move them? How do we do digital transformation? You know, how do we keep our enrollment up? How do we get student success? You know, they're, they're just the changes are going to be numerous. And so I really like the idea of working with a company that provides that trusted, you know, advisor, research role, um, you know, that can help all these different institutions. So what's exciting too is the fact that I'm not just helping one institution, I can help a whole bunch all at the same time. So uh, you've, you've given me a couple of layups to kind of, or lead-ins into the next question that, that segue nicely. So when you see the opportunities, when you see the things that you have noticed and that others have maybe spoken about for years, but mm -hmm. we maybe didn't have enough 
impotence or not enough courage in mm -hmm. some organizations to actually act on these new opportunities or new ways of doing things. Mm -hmm. What do you believe are the things that will really stick? So we're now 13, 14 months into the pandemic mm -hmm. that has crippled and changed and disrupted the planet. Mm -hmm. And it's not over yet. Right. And we don't know if it's something like this will be back later this year, next year, in five, or in 105 years. Mm -hmm. What do you believe when it comes to the future of life and work what do you think will stick? Where do you think all of this is going? How do you think most of our organizations will be operating six, 12, 18 months from now? Yeah. You know, I guess I would kind of summarize that in three ways, right? Three areas that I think are really going to change. The first is just the whole learning environment itself, right? And I, I can't tell you what exactly it's going to go to at this point, but we're going to have changes, right? Because the whole world kind of pivoted from you know, either sitting in front of the, the classroom, right? Sitting in the classroom with the professor in the front and, and traditional learning style, or maybe a synchronous online learning program, right? Where they're dealing with a learning management system and they may or may not be interacting directly with the, with the instructor and or the other students. And then we pivot because of the pandemic to many cases to a or an asynchronous learning, right? Where you've got the professor or an instructor at the front of the classroom, you've got some people in the classroom, you've got other people coming in from all over. In some cases, maybe even the professors coming in virtually. So I think that create that's gonna create a, a lot of change because some of these things are gonna go, hey, you know, that worked well, or this was a great idea. We need to now have this happening all the time. And I think the students are gonna say, yeah, I really like that. I wanna learn this way. And so that's one area I think we're gonna have huge change. The second area is I think data analytics is gonna be huge. We are going to use a lot more analytics. We're gonna find um, you know, ways to analyze that data and use that data for data-driven decision-making. You can already see it. You know, we And all these universities, they have tons of data, right? We have tons of data, but we may not have it all together in a what I would say information, right? It's not necessarily knowledge yet. We haven't inner, you know, integrated some of that data and, and put two and two together to say, hey, look at this. This is an observation and we need to do something about this. And I think the tools and some of the technology, it's, it's you know, it's starting to mature. We're gonna have more ability to, to use that data. And I'm looking at like all different sizes of organizations are gonna take on that data analytics role more and more, you know, especially some that felt, well, we're too small or we can't afford it. They're now going to be able to do that. So I think that's the second one. The other one is just the whole digital transformation and maybe process automation. Some of that whole ERP stuff that, you know, many people are on legacy ERPs. I've talked to a lot of colleagues, uh, you know, across the country who said, yeah, you know, we haven't done much with our ERP, or maybe they're looking to move to the cloud with the ERP, you know, modern type technology. So I think that's going to be a big change for quite a few years for many organizations. Do you, well, I have two kind of sub questions out of what you just shared, and I, and I agree with you. I think data, analytics or data and analytics and being able to make informed decisions is critically important. And what you described when you work at a smaller university, which I have at one point in my career, and you, you get those exact same comments. Well, we're too small. We'll figure it out through Excel or through mm -hmm. Access or, you know, Joe has access to that spreadsheet. But what happens when Joe is retiring after 37 years of service, right? How do you move on? Uh, but what do you, is there an order that you think would, um, two, two, two questions that I have on that is, one is data analytics, um, overall digital transformation, and then learning environments. Do you think these three potential areas of growth and change will be happening at the same time? Do you think one needs to come before the other two as a foundational pillar, if you will? And then the second question is, do you see this being driven by students, faculty, administration, alumni, boards, all of the above. Who do you see, who do you believe will be, will be the greatest um, influencer, if you will, of this change? Yeah. Well, um, I'm gonna kind of start with that one first, 
Now, who's going to influence? And I think it depends on, on what it is, what the topic is, right? Think about the whole learning style and what we've learned. That those The push now to change for the future, I think, is going to come from both faculty and students. I, I think, and, and IT will have to address it. And they're going to have to address that at the same time they're dealing with digital transformation issues and data analytics, right? Now, when it comes to data analytics, whether that comes before some of the, say, the upgrading of the ERP applications or some of that digital transformation regarding automation or process improvements, it, that's going to kind of depend, right? Um, they may say, well, we can't really get the data well out of our current systems, so we need to upgrade. And as part of that upgrade, we'll implement data analytics. In some cases, I think they're going to be doing it simultaneously, right? And the CIO is just going to have to learn how to take on all of that, right? It's, it's, I mean, as a CIO, you know, there are always multiple challenges, competing priorities, because you know, we're one of the few areas in the university um, or really in any organization that sees so, so much of the operations of the entire organization, right? And, and, you know, people will say, well, finance does too. And I go, yes, but they understand it more from the cost perspective, not the operation side. IT really sees kind of the operations, the inner, oper you know, inner operations or integration of operations between different areas. So unfortunately, they, they always deal with competing priorities. And so I think depending upon the organization and what that their priorities are, they may be dealing with all three of these items simultaneously. Uh, I, I agree. I like to think of CIOs as a hub in the hub and spoke model, right? Mm -hmm. We are involved in everybody's business, whether they want us to be involved or not. <laughs> exactly. And finance colleagues often, you know, they'll give you the budget and yeah. say, this is your budget for the year. Have a nice day. There's a process that you follow when it comes to acquisition, purchasing, procurement, and so on. But they're not really um, embedded as as deeply as we might be in the actual processes and the objectives that each of the functional areas has now um with that said and you're you're 100 um right and i'm i agree in, in, with all of your perspectives but as you know and one of the things you said in your opening statement um really kind of hinted and uh, indicated how important leadership is and how that is one of your passions and one of your interests much like mine we know that no change, no change that's sustainable, that's scalable, is done without two areas, right? Consideration of two areas. One is leadership, and I don't necessarily mean those who are in senior executive positions, because leaders mm -hmm. are not titles, positions, cars, corner offices. It's what you do. It's your mm -hmm. actions. You can be seven levels deep and be a bigger leader than the CEO of an organization. Mm -hmm. But leadership on one end, can you speak a bit about the impact of leadership on success mm -hmm. of an organization and or people? Mm -hmm. And two, organizational culture. Where do you see the two come together? Where do you see them competing? Where do you see one nudging the other in a particular direction? How do you see those two opposing yet equally important forces play along, if you will? Yeah. Yeah. Well, like you said, leadership is critical. I have always believed that. And I do agree with you that leadership is not a title. It's really the influence that people have within the organization and they can be anywhere in the organization. But I think anytime you're looking at any change, um, you know, any digital transformation, leadership is critical because and getting other people on board to understand what the change means, how it's going to be beneficial, um, what it's going to require it is very critical. So as a leader, you need to think about things like communication and change management. And so much of change management is communication. It's not like you can really separate them and say they're two different things. But I think though the real strong leaders are making sure they're focusing on that and focusing on you know, the benefits to some change or you know, some new initiative as opposed to the how to do it or the timeline or whatever, like what does it mean for them? Not what is it going to mean for say IT or, or what, you know, but what does it really mean to the people who are going to have to make that change in their life? So I think that's, those two things are very important. 
from a leadership perspective. The other thing, when you talk about culture, culture is also very important. And the leader has to understand what the culture of their organization is and how to communicate and how to implement changes within the culture of the organization. Now, in reality, many times the culture is kind of changing on an ongoing basis, not dramatic change, but there are nuances, right? Especially when new leaders, new maybe titled leaders come into play, things change. And that's why I think a leader, non-titled leader, has to consider that and consider what kind of changes from the culture perspective are coming into play and how do we communicate and how do we address changes within that culture? And in some cases, how do we affect cultural change also that might be required to make something successful? Absolutely, and you're, and you're right. When you're trying to sell or upsell a new product or a new service or moving in a different direction, um, it's really important how do you communicate that and how do you tell a story, right? How do you paint the picture of this journey? Uh, there's someone I spoke with uh, recently who used to work in, in a senior higher ed uh, focused role or educational focused role in Google, at Google. And, and he mentioned saying, you know, I used to travel a lot and I, I knew from my house uh, when to get to the airport, which way to get in, what's the best gate, what to pack. I knew all of that and it worked for me. I've been doing it for years. But if you offered me a private jet, do you think how long I would resist? Do you think how long it would take me to get used to that? Yeah. So you got to figure out a way is how do you build people a private jet? How do you provide them that experience that they haven't had before? Because everybody's tired of learning new things. It's tired of change. Most people are creatures of habit. I keep using this analogy over and over again, but before the pandemic, certainly, I know when I was in Jersey City, I would drive to work the same way. I would get stuck at the same light. I would hit that same pothole and you go, well, I've been doing this for six years. Shouldn't I know better? No, but it's a habit, right? That's what you feel comfortable and that's what you keep doing. Mm -hmm. um, so in order to move forward, right? Whether you're selling a new product, new application, um, program, service, completely new, entering a new market segment. Um, it's important to be open to obviously innovation. It's it, to me, innovation is really um, your, your comfort levels with taking risk and, and your comfort levels in being okay to say, I tripped and I fumbled and I fell on my face. And I know that everybody saw it, but I'm going to get up and dust myself off and I'm going to keep moving forward. Uh, also, innovation to many folks that I speak with uh, on a regular basis initially starts as something transformational. Like it's fire. It's the wheel. It's printing press. Mm -hmm. with it, in, when you really think about it, that's not the case. Mm -hmm. right? It could be incremental, could be transformational, certainly. Um, could be accidental. There's many examples of accidental innovations, right? From, from post-it notes to, you know, you name it, penicillin. Um, how do you see innovation? I look at it as a foundation for our future, right? Without it, if all, if all you're always doing is the same thing that you have done for the last 50, 70, 100 years, at some point, the time is coming, if it's not here already, where the market around you no longer wants that. Want something different, something faster, something quicker, something more appealing, mm -hmm. something that provides that additional value as opposed to, you know, what I can get on my phone in 0.3 seconds from Google, right? Yep. When it comes to innovation, what does it mean to you? Mm -hmm. What is it? And, and I know you've done a lot of innovative work in your career so far, and I'm excited to see what you're going to do moving forward. Uh, in week two, of course, right? Because you're still <laughs> week one. Uh, but but uh, how do you get your teams, how do you get your colleagues to get into that mindset to that it's okay to fail and let's try something new? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I'm going to start with the fact that innovation, and you kind of alluded to it, innovation is really, in my opinion, any, any kind of, potentially any change. They can be really minor little things, incremental change, but then it can be transformational. And what I always like to, like you mentioned the fact that, okay, some innovation is going to fail. Yep, that's true. But but you may, you know you said about getting up and continuing on and moving forward, and I think that's the key, right? To innovation is constantly be looking at 
what can we do to improve, to make things better, to, you know, whether it is incremental or transformational, what can we be doing? And that's, that's really, you know, what innovation is. I think sometimes innovation becomes a buzzword. And I mean, we've been doing innovation for as long as I can remember. We just didn't always call it that. Right, you know, maybe at, at some point in time it was called, oh, we're going to do process re, you know, re-engineering. Well, in a lot of ways, that's innovation. And um, so, yeah, I think, but I do agree that if you're not innovating in one way, shape, or form, I don't think you're growing. I, you know, I remember telling my staff that multiple times, like, hey, we have to keep changing, we have to keep looking for new ways, looking to be better, because if we're just staying the same you know, ultimately we're dying, right? You're either moving forward or you're dying. I don't believe there's, you know, much else, right? And so we're, innovation is critical. And I think there's, there's a lot of innovation going on right now. And I think the rate of change, you know, just continues to increase. And so we as leaders have to look at, okay, from an innovation perspective, where are we going to focus our innovation efforts on and what are we not going to focus on? Because some things maybe have to be put off to the side, right? And maybe, yep, okay, maybe they're not growing and changing, but you have to look at the priorities and say, where does this make sense? You, you made a really good uh, point that I would love for you to expand upon is knowing what to do or what to do next or what to do that's new is extremely important. Mm -hmm. So is knowing what to stop doing. Right. I have these conversations with my teams all the time. And I go, why are we doing this? And the answer we will often get, well, I don't know. We've always done that. Mm -hmm. Right. And it, but first of all, there are seven different ways, because depending on what it is, there are seven different ways of doing this in a much more uh, mature or responsive or modern way, contemporary mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. um, and then in some cases, it's this is not even IT's responsibility. Why are we doing this? Yeah. Right. How do you get that across to your teams, and maybe when you have to sell this to your colleague, your peer, when you go, hey, I understand that we used to do this for you and your department for the last 15 years, yep. but we need to stop. Yep. How do you sell that? Yeah, well, I think I think that's a key. And understanding, you know, who you're trying to sell it to, first of all, and understanding, try to articulate what's the benefit of making that change for them. You know, you know, internally, it'd be great for you, but what is it for them? Why would they want to take it on? I remember a case where we did, we had a function that I went, why are we doing this? We don't do this for anybody else. And it's really not in our wheelhouse. And there, are, and there are, there's another area that does all kinds of other services that are just like that. And, you know, so it was a matter of, okay, you know, selling that to him saying, you know, you're doing all these other things. You could, you know, I can help you incrementally take this other service on. I think it would be better from the student perspective. They would get, you know, better service. So, you know, thinking about it from the other person's benefit is really, really important. But boy, you made a good point about what should we stop doing? Because so many times, and, and you know, that's one thing that's nice about being new and in, in, in that role is I can ask the questions as I'm learning. You know, that's a, a question. Why do we do that? How does this work? You know, and then you can start thinking about, you know, why? And then you can come back later and go, why, why are we doing this? You know, I mean, that's something, especially as things change and priorities change and think about it from, um, you know, leader's perspective, think about IT as a CIO, you've got all of these things and you've got more and more stuff needs are great, greater than we can provide. People are asking for more and more services and, you know, we're not necessarily getting more, more resources. So we have to sit and say, okay, well, if we're going to do this, what's not a priority anymore? Or what, you know, what can we eliminate? What can we, or what can we change to improve? How can we, you know, how can we standardize something that's not been standard before? I think those are things that a leader constantly needs to look at. How do we improve our services? How do we improve the workflow? How do we improve the products that we're providing? How do we improve everything? That's a really good point. That's, that's one of my favorite things to do. I'm, I'm, I'm slowly coming out of that honeymoon phase, right? Because I've been here for eight months. Yeah. But in the first three to six months, depending on the organization and the scope, it could last up to a year. It's one of my favorite things to come in and go, 
I, I don't know what that means. I don't know. Why are we doing this? Can somebody help me understand? And you're not being malicious. You're not being ill and ill. You're not approaching it with an ill intent. You're just trying to understand it. But by you asking those questions, you may uncover something for those who are already there. This, to, for them themselves to ask themselves and go, why is it that we're doing this? Mm -hmm. Right? Or that are we still doing this? That, right. That's a great right. point. And, and you may find out that, hey, they've already thought through this and there's some logic to the, to what we're doing. And then you go, oh, well, that makes perfect sense. You know, so it, it but it does, like you said, the other person or the people doing that, that work can also question it, you know, and, and, and maybe go, I don't know, we've always done it this way. You know, those are the ones you really have to have to look into to say, well, is this really the best approach? Absolutely. It's if we can all reframe our mindset to more of a learning opportunity for all, as opposed to being territorial or confrontational and saying, well, this is what I do. Who are you to tell me what to do? You just got here. Yeah. Right. Or stick to your side of the fence yeah. or stay in your swim lane. Yeah. Right. If you give different perspectives and different thoughts and different ideas, mm -hmm. generally, if it's done in a constructive and positive manner, everybody, um, everybody benefits. Yeah, exactly. so, and that's almost coming at it from a leadership perspective also that you're, you're there to learn and to understand. And that's why you're asking the questions, not because you want to change it. Correct. Absolutely. Because not every, I agree with you, not every change is a change. Not every change occurs because what was there before was bad in any right. way. There's mm -hmm. just might be a different way of doing it now that it wasn't mm -hmm. available seven years ago when that process was implemented. It right. doesn't mean it's a bad thing. It means it was the best thing possible at that time, but many years have gone by. There might be a different way of doing it. Now, when it comes to, obviously, since your seventh birthday forward, right, for 30 <laughs> years across your career, um, is there a challenge or two that really stands out to you and resonates that you have seen repeatedly, either across the industry? And when I say industry, it could be technology and or higher ed, right? There's two different paths there, mm -hmm. or it could be across your own roles. Is there something that you see as an ongoing challenge that at this point you go, I, I, I thought we would be over that by now, right? Why does this keep happening? Why does this keep happening? What is that for you? And what are some of the thoughts of, of resolving it in a sense? You know, I, I think one of the things that I have seen in multiple organizations, industries, companies, and I almost think it's kind of human nature, is um, you know, not necessarily the silo piece, but that everybody's independent. And, you know, um, and thinking, you know, looking at what's, what's here as opposed to what's here, right? I've always believed that it's my job, you know, to look at the whole organization that I'm in, right? And what's the best approach you know, for the entire organization, not just what's best for me or what's best for my staff, what's best in the organization. And I think I, I've seen in every type of organization I've been in, I think you end up seeing some of those silos and it's getting people to collaborate and communicate and cross boundaries and understand each other, I think is really critical to a successful organization. I, I agree. Um, it is very challenging. Maybe not challenging, but it's difficult. It's difficult to find true visionaries and true leaders who have that ability to mm -hmm. extend and go for those reach assignments, if you will. Yeah. Like, hey, my functional experience is legal. That's yeah. all I do and that's all I'm going to do. Yeah. But you have an analytical brain then maybe you should look at these other four areas that touch legal all the time. And is there a better way? Um, I agree. Different perspective. Now, when it comes to people, to, you know, you've accomplished a lot in your life, in your career, and I, I'm positive you have many more accomplishments ahead. And you know that you have a fan in me um, in, in everything that you do. To those of to those of us or those who would be listening or watching this podcast and saying, how do I do what Kathy is doing or how do I do what Kathy has done? What's some of the advice that really stands out and resonates for you, for those who aspire to reach your level of success one day? That's a very good question. Um, and I think what I would probably tell people is focus on the other person or the needs of them first, right? What, 
you know, what do other people want um, to know, to learn, you know, to grow? I think that's important. Being able to show that you're willing to, to learn, willing to do what it takes to be successful, you know, stepping up, uh, volunteering for, um, for work. And again, trying to think outside your actual little box, right? Everybody has a job. Everybody has a job description. Everybody has their tasks that they daily do. And I think, um, you know, to grow, to move into different positions, to move up the leadership channel, and to even just exert more leadership in your current role. I think those are the things that you have to think about. Think outside your current little space and think more about the other person and what they need. Focusing on pattern recognition, right? And bringing them all to light because of your role, you'll be able to see all of those things you'll be exposed. Mm -hmm. And then the second one is someone I know always says 5149. And I go, what does that mean? He goes in every interaction, give a little bit more than you take. Doesn't need because you don't want to be so you don't want to be a fool, right? You don't want to be you know taking advantage of either where the other side always has 70 or 80 percent of the upside, right? Well, that's that's a really not a good strategy and not negotiate, not, not great negotiating skills, if you will, but always give a little bit more than you take. And then when you build the credibility and you build the reputation of someone like that, um, you always get yours. Mm -hmm. your your career your title your money your whatever it is it that you're looking for in search of as a professional mm -hmm. fulfillment always has a way of finding you uh once you've put enough good things out in the world so i 100 percent agree with you um last question that i have because i know we're, we're coming up on time because you and i chatted for a bit before you started recording which mm -hmm. i enjoy um i've asked you a lot of questions we talked about a lot of different things and i think you and i will probably have uh, need to have more calls and more episodes down the road because there's so much there that you can unpack on and, and teach us all. But what question would you have for those listening or, or watching this podcast? What is it that you would like to learn or know? Some mm -hmm. people have asked questions in the past that were very specific. Okay, mm -hmm. I'm currently have this issue and problem that I'm dealing with. How do you do it? Mm -hmm. And then others have come in at a larger, more conceptual model and saying, hey, I know that this is a problem in the world or in this industry or in this profession. How are you addressing it? How are you doing it? Uh, and so forth. So what question would you have for the audience? Mm -hmm. Well, one question I can think of right away, and this kind of relates to the whole higher ed uh, market because I've been in it for so long and especially now my new role. So you asked me about, you know, what are the top, you know, three things that I see changing or, you know, to that effect. And I would like to ask other people, well, what do they see? You know, what am I missing? What, what do they see changing? And, you know, what's important? Um, that's, a, that's, I think, a big one for me is what, and, and the same thing on the leadership side, you know, from what I've said, what am I missing? Or, you know, is there some, something that other leaders think is really critical that we haven't brought up today? That is, you asked two questions and I like them. Um, and, and that is that is really important. Um, again, it's a little bit unfair advantage because you and I know each other a bit, yeah. but um, we're both such believers in, in leadership and impact and service that comes with those roles and at times courage. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I've seen in my career is some really, really great people who had a lot of leadership potential mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. have folded like a cheap beach chair with the first wave of pressure right first wave of pushback and sometimes you need to have courage and understand that leadership is not a popularity contest because if you're in an organization of a thousand people mm -hmm. and everybody loves you all the time 24 7 i will tell you with certainty that you're not leading yeah, because you're just making you're just responding to anybody coming up and, and yeah. you're playing whack-a-mole, if you will, and just addressing the most uh, mm -hmm. the squeakiest of wheels at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, anything else you would like to say as we as we close out another episode? Um, I, I don't think so. I really appreciate you taking the time to talk with me. It's been great. And it was nice to catch up with you, too. Abs absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm looking forward to seeing what you're going to do at the Tambellini Group. 
I know of all the wonderful things you've done in the past um, at universities and some of the other consulting engagements that you had. Um, I want to thank you again for being my guest today and for joining me uh, for, for a bit to chat about some of your thoughts and experiences. And I look forward to us spending some more time together and, and unpacking some other topics at a later date. Sounds good. And I want to thank everybody listening to this episode. If this is the first one you've seen, consider subscribing and sharing it with your friends and colleagues. And most importantly, leave the thoughts below on the topics that we've discussed and covered and answer those two questions that Kathy asked. I wish everyone a wonderful day. And don't ever forget that anything of significance in life always requires time, effort, and energy as there are no shortcuts. Have a wonderful day.